Again, thank you for joining us this evening. You're now attending the webinar entitled Looking for the Good War. Our leader again for this session is Elizabeth D. Samet, Professor of English, Department of English and Philosophy, United States Military Academy. I also want to note that we're joined by Gina Elia of North Broward Preparatory School in Coconut Creek, Florida. Gina is a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council who will serve as our TA for tonight's session. She'll be active in the chat, sharing thoughts, resources, and asking questions. So again, Gina, thank you for joining us. Let us proceed. Elizabeth D. Samet is the author of No Man's Land, Preparing for War and Peace in Post-9-11 America. Soldier's Heart, Reading Literature Through Peace and War at West Point which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Current Interest and was named one of the 100 Notable Books of 2007 by the New York Times. And Willing Obedience, Citizens, Soldiers, and the Progress of Consent in America, 1776-1898. Samet is the editor of Leadership Essential Writings by Our Greatest Thinkers, the annotated memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant and World War II memoirs, Pacific Theater. The recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Grant and the Hyatt Prize in the Humanities. She was also awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship to support the research and writing of Looking for the Good War. She is a professor of English at West Point. Again, it's an honor to have you here with us tonight, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh such a delight to be able to speak with educators, fellow educators from across the country. I want to thank you and Raven um, and Gina as well for uh, being tonight's TA. So let me start off. Um, one of my priorities in studying and teaching World War II has always been to tell multiplicity of stories. And I shared some of those with all of you in the articles that were circulated beforehand. And I plan to focus on different but complementary stories tonight. And of course, I'll be happy to answer questions about the articles or about the other stories that I tell uh, this evening. And I want to begin on a biographical note. I, I first knew the Second World War as my father's war. And I grew up asking him to tell me stories. And I will share the anecdotes he shared with me. And I grew up believing that his war was somehow different. It was from all those that followed, especially from Vietnam, which was the preoccupation of most of my friends' parents. In World War II, the cause was just the outcome definitive, the national commitment to the war effort well nigh universal. This was all part and parcel of the story. But I also came to understand that World War II was just as brutal and grim and full of misery as every other war. The epithet good war came to seem misleading at best, especially as the United States found itself at war not, all, not long after I began to teach aspiring military officers at West Point. And as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan wore on, accompanied as they were by so many references to that earlier conflict, I became increasingly aware of the damage done to our collective memory by insisting on re World War II as exclusively the stuff of legend. So whenever I speak about the book that grew out of this period and these discoveries, I find it helpful to clarify that it's not a history of World War II. I'm not a historian, as some of you probably are, but a student of literature. It's not an argument that participation was unnecessary or unjustified, and it's not an attempt to diminish either the cruelty and crimes of the Axis powers or the significance of the Allied victory and the post-war liberal order it achieved. Instead, my work is an exploration of the ways in which our really quite complicated participation in the war, our participation that was baited, ambivalent, reactive rather than proactive, has been transformed over the decades into a far more flattering myth. So now to my first story. During World War II, 
American automobile owners were required to affix gas rationing stickers to their windshields. Drivers were classified by their occupation, A, B, C, etc., and each was authorized a certain number of gallons per week. The back of these stickers posed a pointed question to anyone sitting behind the wheel. Is this trip really necessary? The stickers asked. Designed to train the driver's attention on an unseen war being fought far away, the sticker became at once a badge of sacrifice and a practical necessity. It would soon become a valuable black market commodity. In May 1942, to save fuel and tires, a number of states also introduced a 35 mile per hour speed limit. They called it victory speed. As the literary critic and combat veteran Paul Fussell proposed in his provocative 1989 book, Wartime, the resulting inconvenience, as he said, served to remind Americans that there was a war on. That the public should be reminding that there was, in fact, a robust illegal market, chiefly in beef and gasoline, that was operated, as John Steinbeck, the novelist, noted in a newspaper article in 1943, not by, quote, little crooks, but the best people, end quote. That the government felt the need to launch an unprecedented propaganda campaign to motivate civilians and soldiers alike, all these facts suggest the degree to which the goodness, the idealism, the unanimity we today reflexively associate with World War II were not as readily apparent to Americans at the time. And the posters you see here are part of that propaganda campaign. And throughout this presentation, I have, sh I will show you images um, that really come from a variety. That they're all um, government posters, but they offer a variety of perspectives on the war, and they suggest the degree to which the civilian population had to be motivated. They're also, I find, great teaching tools. A man named John Abbott was a conscientious objector assigned by the authorities to a series of stateside public works details until he refused even this duty. Convicted in 1943 for failing to remain in a public service camp, Abbott served two years in a federal prison. Years after the war, in an interview with Studs Terkel, Abbott recalled a prank he and some of his fellow COs used to play. He told Turkle, these gasoline stickers for rationing that you had on your windshield had a little note on them. It said, is this trip really necessary? We'd scratch out trip, Abbott continued, and war. Is this war really necessary? One can disagree with Abbott. In other words, one can, as I do, believe that the United States' involvement in the war was necessary yet still question the way that that participation has been remembered in the work of wars considerably less galvanizing and unifying. And so the questions I began to ask include the following. Has the prevailing memory of the good war, shaped by nostalgia, sentimentality, and sometimes jingoism, more harm than good to American sense of themselves and their country's place in the world? Has the meaning of American force been perverted by a strident, self-congratulatory insistence that a war that was extraordinary in certain aspects was in fact unique in all, and that our victory was proof of America's exceptionalism? Finally, has the repeated insistence by so many on the country's absolute unity behind the war effort effectively exacerbated ongoing social and political divisions that we see in the news every day. So now I'd like to go into a little detail about what I'm calling the myth of World War II. Its most powerful and influential version can be boiled down into certain ingredients. And here they are. The first, that the United States went to war to liberate the world from fascism and tyranny. The second, all Americans 
who are absolutely united in their commitment to that effort. Everyone on the home front made tremendous sacrifices. Americans in general are liberators who fight decently, reluctantly, and only when they must. World War II for tragedy with a happy American ending. And then last, everyone has always agreed on points one, five. We automatically tend to repeat these things, even though we know at some level beneath the righteous passion that it can't be entirely true. That is the tale, though, that continues to dominate the popular imagination and the politicians' rhetoric. The myth, I think, confuses many things and simplifies. First, the consequences of the Allied victory, the very real liberation of Europe from Nazi tyranny chief among those consequences, eventually came to be understood as the animating cause of our participation. Our celebration of ourselves as righteous liberators hid a truth that many Americans, wedded to post-World War I isolationism, largely ignored and in certain cases celebrated the rise of fascism in the 1930s. The war, greatest generation, and other self-congratulatory phrases obscure these compromising details. They obscure our initial reluctance to enter the war on behalf of liberating anyone. They obscure our internment of Japanese Americans at home. Our callousness toward the fate of European Jewry even after the war in our administration of the displaced person camps. And our exportation of Jim Crow segregation to post-war Europe. The idea of the good war likewise emphasizes home front solidarity, while ignoring the reluctance that survived even Pearl Harbor in some quarters as well as the diversity of motives, including cynical opportunism at work among many supporters of the war. Moreover, the myth exaggerates the economic sacrifices of a country that the war actually brought back to work for the first time after the Depression. Many Americans suddenly had more money than they ever had before. This extraordinary instance of American military might leading to the liberation of so many gave rise to a faith that whenever we employ violence abroad, it will be met with the world's gratitude and will yield a similar result. And that if it doesn't, it is somehow not our fault. We retain, I think, an almost inexhaustible capacity for surprise when going to war doesn't bring about another 1945. And so the myth of the good war turns American violence into a special case its brutality miraculously mitigated by national temperament. The myth exists at war, at least when we prosecute it, is not a tragedy, but a comedy. And I mean that in the rich literary sense of comedy, as a plot that restores chaos, order to chaos, sorts out the winners and the losers, and enlarges the circle of justice, and thereby declares victory. It also obscures one of the most crucial senses in which World War II was unique, and that's its scope and methods of destruction. The most potent and highly polished version of the World War II myth, which crystallized in the celebration of the greatest generation in the late 90s, began with the Reagan-era determination to erase the shame of Vietnam and gain momentum with the war's 50th anniversary celebrations. Its chief evangelists were the historian Stephen Ambrose, the journalist Tom Brokaw, and in certain respects, the filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Today, in a century defined by renewed confusion about why we go to war and how we get out of it once we do, World War II endures for so many a testament to the redemptive capacity of American violence. We've continued to frame our enemies as fascists, while the post-9-11 term axis of evil reminded us of the axis powers of old. Long axiomatic World War II's goodness and the greatness of the generation that fought it had 
five subsequent questions about the atomic bomb's necessity and condemnations of the firebombing of German and Japanese cities. It withstood and gathered strength from gradual erosion of American confidence in the latter half of the 20th century, when a series of misguided military adventures failed to achieve anything like victory. The hold exerted by the war remains strong, one of the few national stories still available to both major political parties in a deep partisan nation. Very mention of World War II tends to encourage emotional, hyperbolic claims. How, for example, does one calculate the greatness of a generation? Stephen Ambrose, for his part, imagined he was writing about giants. He was, as he said, a hero worshiper. As a hero worshiper, he promulgated a fantasy that American soldiers somehow preserved a boyish innocence amid the slaughter required to save, in his words, the world from barbarism. In his book, Band of Brothers, eventually turned into an HBO miniseries, Ambrose's paratroopers appear to be motivated by a heady combination of patriotism and fraternity. Even though social science research, some of it conducted during the war, tells us that World War II soldiers, approximately 60% of whom were draftees, were in fact likely, less likely to be motivated by ideological commitments than were either their civil war protests or those soldiers fighting as part of the all-volunteer force in the post-9-11 conflicts. Tom likewise describes in his book, The Greatest Generation, a country of unparalleled unity and commitment to the war effort. And he comes to the overdetermined conclusion but that, that by 1940, it was apparent, as he writes, to all but a few delusional isolationists that war would define this generation's coming of age. Lokoff's claim dramatically undersells the fervor and reach of the nation's fascist sympathizers who worked throughout the war, even after Pearl Harbor. The most celebrated of these groups, the America First Committee, was led by a national hero, the aviator Charles Lindbergh, who delivered a notoriously anti-Semitic speech on September 11, 1941, and was still championing isolationism at a rally in Madison Square Garden on October 30, 1941. The journalist Eric Severide recalled returning from Europe after the war began to a decidedly neutral United States with which he felt himself at odds. The country, Severi reflected, quote, was just entering torture, trying to make up her mind. When Severi, like others who had recently returned from abroad, vainly tried to inspire Americans to cause fighting fascism, he confronted what he found a fundamental suspicion in the American character, an outgrowth, Severi continued, of de democratic habit part of its bulwark in normal times, but now a downright menace as precious time rushed by. There was no official government unity either. Senator Burton K. Wheeler headlined a Keep America Out of the War rally in Chicago in July 1940, and the North Dakota Senator Gerald P. Nye found himself on stage at an America First rally on December 7, 1941. Nye had to be told three times by a journalist that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor before he would even believe that it happened. And on the third time, he carried on with his evening round of speeches, and he told reporters, we have been maneuvered into this by the president. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor did not silence the dissenting voices, although it certainly muted many of them. But it did provoke a reaction and vengeance became the goad used to generate public enthusiasm. The historian Richard w. w. Steele observed in an article in the Journal of American History in 1978 that the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought war, but not unity, to the American people. Steele goes on to cite opinion polls in 1942 that revealed a peace bloc comprising fully 20% of the adult population. These post-Pearl Harbor divisionists, Steele notes, 
quote, were strikingly similar in numbers and attitudes to the isolation of 1941. And by February 1942, the Roosevelt administration was concerned about, quote, the shallowness of public commitment to the war. That's only, remember, a few months later. The consensus, Steel writes, was that after the initial shock of Pearl Harbor had worn off, the public had lapsed into complacency. As Steele recognized, a large portion of the population was still confused about war aims and insufficiently committed to the war effort. Six months into the country's involvement, 53 Americans polled, Steele reports, admitted that they did not have a clear idea of what the war was about. President Roosevelt believed that proponents of a negotiated peace included even leaders of the Republican Party some of whom had been contacted by German agents. Steele concludes, apparently, only a lack of organization significantly differentiated sentiment for a negotiated peace with the isolationism of 1941. Calling attention to the deep cynicism with which many Americans responded to the war, Severi, the journalist, Members of the spendthrifts, bootleggers, and profiteers he encountered in New York and Washington, where they danced in nightclubs to what he thought was the sack tune of Remember Pearl Harbor. They complained about sugar rationing or derided the four freedoms, as he wrote, and the great vision of the century of the common man as, quote, global only. Seeing the advertisements proclaiming lucky strikes had gone to war, advising the country that its war production would be increased if everyone masticated a few extra sticks of Wrigley's per day, Severide confirmed the general mood of a nation that was, in his eyes, encouraged to believe that it could reduce its way to victory or buy its victory by the simple measure of writing a check. Life was easy, Severide notes, and getting more prosperous every week, and nobody believed in death. That, Severide thought, was a fantasy encouraged by the War Department's censorship of photographs depicting dead service members. One of the most remarkable aspects of the triumph of the Good War mythology is how thoroughly it has obscured the altogether more open, ambivalent, reflective mode of remembrance that has in fact persisted all along. We tend to remember only certain parts In 1984, only 10 years really before the great 50th anniversary celebrations, the great radio personality and oral historian Studs Terkel produced yet another in his series of histories, The Good War, an oral history of World War II, and he put good war in quotes. Terkel's books all derive their strength from contradiction and ambiguity. And this book is no exception. It recovers as wide a collection of often conflicting memories as possible. Turkle talked to everyone, not only the admirals, but the merchant marines, not only the high-placed government officials, but the GIs, not only the famous SO entertainers, but the unknown defense workers, as well as the nurses, the ideologues, the pacifists, and everyone in between. It is a powerfully diverse collection of voices, many of which have too often gone unheard or been silenced. And Turkle made no attempt to reduce the cacophony to a single refrain, to reconcile the differences of opinion that he found, or to shape contradictory accounts into a single uncomplicated narrative. The sentimental and the disillusioned, the jingoistic and the thoughtfully patriotic, the nostalgic and the dismissive. All these perspectives share the stage in Perkle's Good War. And this fundamental disagreement for what to make of the war becomes by far the strongest evidence of authentic democracy. And it's for that reason that I find this Turkle book and others so wonderful to teach, so rich to explore with students. And so now I'd like to move on to the next section of the talk and to talk a little bit about wartime impressions. 
do it by means of another story, a rather different one, this one involving movie star. In the spring of 1938, Anna Dietrich, along with several other movie stars, was declared box office poison. The following year, 1939, a huge year for Hollywood and a huge year, of course, for the entire world, a tragic comic western called Destry Rides Again brought Dietrich back to Hollywood. This film read the fable of America's relationship to global events in the 1930s. Fired by Paramount Studios, her projects at all other studios canceled, Dietrich had left Europe for Europe, briefly returning to the United States only to finalize her American citizenship thereby cutting ties with her, neighbor, her native Germany, whose politics she despised. In the doomed summer of 1939, excuse me, she was in the south of France. Fellow European expatriate Joe Pasternak in, offered her the role of Frenchie, a singer from New Orleans. Of course, all four accents were interchangeable in Hollywood in the 1930s performing in a saloon in the lawless western town of Bottleneck. Although she initially thought the proposition ridiculous, she needed the money, as her biographer Stephen Bach has documented, and she knew that Europe was on the brink of disaster. So she accepted the offer and sailed for New York in August. Typical of so many of the films of Hollywood's golden age, Destry was a thoroughly international confection. It was full of American-born personalities and immigrants from a variety of countries. And it transformed two of its stars, in particular, Jimmy Stewart. In the New York Times review, Frank Nugent alluded to the film's international dynamic. With a sweep of his Hungarian fist, he wrote, the director has taken Marlena Dietrich off her high horse and placed her in a horse opera and has converted James Stewart, last seen as Washington's timid Mr. Smith, into the hard-hitting son of an old sagebrush sheriff. Hollywood alchemy worked in such a way that a Hungarian could transform the most high flute European into a woman equipped for the frontier and turn an American boy into a real man. That was the message. The new world had triumphed over the old, the masculine over the feminine. Such priorities had long been essential to the Western. Destry is not an entirely conventional example. Jimmy Stewart's character, who's named Thomas Jefferson Destry Jr., newly appointed sheriff in the town, is initially, and I think this is important, a reluctant gunfighter. He must be provoked into violence. The residences with the United States in 1939 are clear. Young Tom, who saw his father, a celebrated lawman, shot in the back, refuses to carry a gun, much to the consternation and amusement of the townsfolk. It is only when the crooked gambler who runs the town, a man named Kent, murders the good-natured old sheriff who had hired Destry to clean it up in the first place, that the outraged deputy straps on his gun belt and fulfills the expectations of the genre by gunning down his man. Destry, I think, has a deeply ambivalent attitude toward violence as an inherently tragic remedy to the very real problems of lawlessness. It also has a far more optimistic perspective the relationship between the lawman and the community he protects than some of the later Westerns that came after the war. Towns of bottleneck are with Destry, not as they will be in other post-war Westerns, indifferent or fearful, willing to leave their fate to a coterie of weary professionals. So as I suggested, Marlena Dietrich's career was resurrected by this film, but the war soon put it on hold. Now an American, officially, as well as on the screen, she committed herself to the war effort. And at first, this meant working long nights in the kitchen of the Hollywood canteen and volunteering to be spawn in half by Orson Welles, 
in the magic show he staged in a tent for the benefit of GIs. Eventually, however, it meant donning a bespoke GI uniform and deploying to North Africa and Europe, where she tirelessly entertained the troops. And one of her complaints, and it's something that's echoed by journalists like A.J. Liebling and Ernie Pyle when they returned from abroad, is that in America, quote, one was hardly aware of the war. After Dietrich returned from North Africa and Italy, she gave an interview in 1944 for an issue of Vogue magazine. Throughout the interview, she expresses her frustration with home front attitudes. She's outraged, for example, that blood donations require, as she said, propaganda. We've had to beg for it. That's amazing, she told the interviewer. Having seen the demand for various resources at the front, she expresses a similar frustration at complaints regarding gas rationing and other domestic restrictions. Dietrich's experience also gave her an appreciation for a cooperative spirit and for what she called extraordinary confidence in everybody who's around. This quality seemed unique to military life to Dietrich. She signed up, it's worth noting, for the duration. I won't sign any contracts here that would tie me down. I will not sit here working my little job and let the war pass me by. Over there, no one says, let the other fellow do it. They do it themselves. When Dietrich returned to the United States in the summer of 39 to begin filming, it was only natural that she should sail on a ship called the SS Normandy. It was a French liner, the largest and fastest around, and it could make the transatlantic crossing in just under four days. The ship catered to the elite, but it also carried tourists and unknown, if no less extraordinary people, like Esther Silverstein, a nurse who left her job at the Marine Hospital in San Francisco to aid the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. Silverstein sailed on the Normandy in May 1937 served with the 35th International Division Sanitary Corps for more than a year, and subsequently joined the Army Nurse Corps during World War II. She joined almost 3,000 American volunteers in the Spanish Republic's fight against Franco, whose military coup was, from the outset, supported by men and materiel from Italy and Germany, from what would become the Axis powers. The indifference with which European democracies met the upheaval in Spain and Italy's takeover of Ethiopia before it was not lost on Europeans and Americans who joined the international brigades to fight fascist aggression. Despite Franklin Roosevelt's 1937 speech at the Bridge Dedication in Chicago, known as the Quarantine Speech, and the hope it gave to interventionists with its characterization of the world's politics as, quote, a reign of terror and international lawlessness, end quote, the United States continued to adhere to the series of neutrality acts passed earlier in the decade. Italy, and to an even greater extent Germany, used this latter conflict as a dress rehearsal for battles to come, especially for the Luftwaffe and the war in the air. The only power to intervene on the Republican side was the Soviet Union, which joined with avowed communists, socialists, anarchists, Republicans, and others in their fight on behalf of the Republic. It is estimated that about 70% of the Americans who fought in Spain with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade were communists. Others were fellow travelers, or they simply understood the fight as an anti-fascist one. As the classicist Bernard Knox, who fought with a British contingent in Spain, and then later with the U.S. Army in World War II, noted, the American volunteers of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade were known to the FBI as premature anti-fascists. Knox continues, it was an, an accusation, but it is a designation that all those who fought for the Republic can accept with pride. He goes on to say, we were ahead of everybody else in something that had to be done. Even in the light of later revelations about the extent of Soviet manipulation and interference, Knox refused to repudiate the Republican cause. He said, war is an ugly business at best, as Thucydides said long ago. It is a teacher of violence and reduces most men's temper to the level of their circumstances. 
Whether or not they had been Communist Party members, the veterans of the Lincoln Brigade were put under government surveillance, ostensibly because of their earlier violation of the U.S. Neutrality Acts. When they volunteered to fight fascism once again after Pearl Harbor, they learned that they had been blacklisted as premature anti-fascists, or PAFs. Despite the fact that they were among the few Americans with recent combat experience, they were initially prevented from obtaining commissions and often shunted off to camps for troublemakers and politically suspect, suspect conscripts and fascists. The irony of being lumped in with fascists was not lost on the veterans of the Lincoln Brigade, who were generally more politically engaged than many of their fellow soldiers, and who had been in any case thinking about the global struggle in one way or another since the mid-1930s. Until the press picked up the cause, many were restricted to support jobs and kept out of combat. The hounding of the veterans of the Lincoln Brigade, even those who went on to serve honorably in World War II, resumed in 1947 when the Red Scare began in earnest. When Knox discovered that he had been labeled an ant a premature anti-fascist, which was, which was not until after the war, he said, how, I wondered, could anyone be a premature anti-fascist? Could there be anything such as a premature antidote to a poison? If you were not premature, what sort of anti-fascist were you supposed to be? A punctual anti-fascist? A timely one? It is a perfect description, Knox concludes, Neville Chamberlain and Lord Halifax, last-minute anti-fascists. But in 1939, Knox concludes, last minute was too late. As the series of official guidebooks issued to American service personnel during the war makes clear, government's suspicion of premature anti-fascists was matched by its desire to combat sympathy with actual fascists. These books attempt in various ways to forge bonds with our allies while also explaining the evils of our enemies. American hostility for Nazis, despite the death camps and the ample evidence of the regime's horrors, lacked the intensity of what the Marine veteran E.B. Sledge, who served in the Pacific, calls a burn hatred, end quote, for the Japanese, because as one guidebook observes, Germans tended to look just like Americans. That guidebook warns vehemently against fraternization and insists that the surface friendliness of the average Sherman conceals a ruthless and duplicitous enemy brainwashed in the master race theory. Hatred for the Japanese, by contrast, was sparked by visions rooted in racism and stoked by crude propaganda. It was all too easy for Americans to regard the Japanese as subhuman but European fascists were more often described as gangsters. This vocabulary appeared in the artful speeches of Churchill and Roosevelt, as well as in the cables of various diplomats. In a speech on the Soviet-German war, Churchill referred to Nazi gangsters and to Hitler as a bloodthirsty gutter snipe. Roosevelt began his 1944 of the Union Address by describing, quote, a world that has been gravely threatened with what he called gangster rule. And to complete the picture, British command in Malaya characterized the Japanese forces operating there, quote, as a highly trained army of gangsters, equipped with a high proportion of army guns and mortars, and employing all kinds of ruses in an attempt to lower the morale of our troops. Charles de Gaulle added a new twist when, during a an acrimonious meeting in London, he declared Churchill himself a gangster. The Allies discovered in the grammar of 1930s Hollywood an ideal way to distill geopolitical complexities for their audience of service members. Having suggested that the English and Germans supposedly formed their impressions of Americans from the movies, the authors of the official guidebooks used cinematic vocabulary to let out the world situation for soldiers and sailors. A pocket guide to France, for example, takes this to an extreme degree 
After they liberate France from the Nazi mob, the GI will still have to beware of getting too friendly with a special sort of hard-boiled dame, as the guidebook read, and he should remain his guard. The Pocket Guide translates the war into a gangster film with an international cast. It is a universe in which the American hero triumphs because decently, all, decency always wins in the end. Mostly, the guide told soldiers, the French think Americans always act square, always give the little fellow a helping hand, are good-natured, big-hearted, and kind. Gangster films of the 30s atoned for their excesses and indulgences by offering a formal recantation and punishing the criminal in the final reel. Justice seemed somehow to reassert itself in the end. In the decade after the war, among the various messages communicated in film noir, that descendant of the 30s gangster picture, the fiction on which much of it was based, with that decently, decency doesn't always win out and that heroes and villains can prove difficult to tell apart because their methods are very much the same. And this brings me to a consideration of the post-war period, which I've entitled War Gangers. Of course, numerous film historians have chronicled the rise and fall of film noir from the war to the middle of the 1950s and they've analyzed its enduring stylistic, linguistic, and cultural influence. And these are films that can be taught in part or in their entirety. It was the French who had been star of American films throughout the war who later gave the style its name. And in 1955, two French critics, Bord and Chomaton, used film noir to describe a certain kind of American movie that began to be shown in French cinemas in 1946. The pair defined the follows. Film noir has renovated the theme of violence, they wrote. Always an integral part of American film, of course, violence, they argued, had previously been bounded by certain rules, as in the fair fight of the adventure film. In place of the washbuckling heroes of old, however, there now emerged what they called an unknown breed of men, ambiguous, various, and volatile cool professional killers, unthinking brutes, or maniacal sadists, all of them equally at home in a world of chaotic violence. These films were often beat pictures with low budgets, and they ran in typical movie theaters all over the country, as opposed to the grand movie palaces of New York, Los Angeles, and other major cities, although some noir ran in these grander settings, too. These films exerted an influence on a generation of young moviegoers who might spend much of a day in movies. The pulp fiction on which many of these films were based, not infrequently, center on the disaffected veteran. In part, of course, this owes to the simple fact that there were millions of newly returned GIs. Dorothy Hughes's Dick Steele, the uh, central character of In a Lonely Place, and the subject of one of the articles in the recommended reading, may be one of the most extreme versions of the alienated veteran in post-war fiction, but his emotional isolation and his inability to reacclimate to peacetime is consistent with the portraits of veterans found throughout the 1940s and 1950s. Scores of films throughout this period, many of which I was able to watch at the Library of Congress, address in direct or indirect ways the challenges of veteran readjustment, and they examine the fate of veterans at the margins of American society. Some of the films are dramas that explore physical and psychological wounds of war. Others are comedies that address readjustment in a different register. And finally, there were films that used the war and its veterans as an occasion to direct various direct attention to various social injustices, racism, anti-Semitism, and other concerns. Film noir offers only the most surreal reflection of the experiences of war, and it's constantly intruding memories, memories that erupted in highbrow literature and in lowbrow. Audiences were 
kind, it seemed, to accept a connection between military service and crime. And war service also tends to feature in the lives of the police and detectives in these post-war films, as well as the criminals themselves. Whether they are private detectives who've been kicked off the police force or renegades working uneasily within departments for bosses who don't appreciate their methods, outlaw status of all of these detectives mirrors that of the criminals they pursue. And it's chiefly in film noir that the relentless optimism of Hollywood recedes before a far grimmer picture. Having been estranged in one way or another, often from themselves, veterans come home in these films to operate, at least for a time, on the margins of society, most often in the harsh city, but sometimes in the seemingly idyllic small town. And this is a case with a film called Act of Violence from 1948. And in this talk, that film has to stand in for many, many others. It tells a disturbing and powerful story of an apparently successful veteran, Frank Henley, a former bomber pilot whose post-war respectability and prosperity is built on a lie. Henley lives in the picture postcard California town. And I noticed that many people in the audience are from California, which I know has also not felt so picture postcard of late, and I hope you're all doing okay. He lives in this town with his wife, Edith, and their baby. His contracting business has prospered during the post-war housing boom, and the fragility of his life is quickly exposed when a newspaper clipping touting Enley's wartime heroism and peacetime success reveals his location to one of his former friends, his bombardier, in fact, a man named Joe Parkson. The film opens on the nighttime streets of New York City, the Chrysler building looming in the sky, and we hear Parkinson's footsteps as he drags his wounded leg across the street and up the stairs of a dingy, dark building so he can pack his service revolver and his army grip. He boards the bus for Los Angeles on a vengeful quest to murder Enley, who betrayed the men under his command while they were POWs in Germany. Parkinson arrives in this little town on Memorial Day. The sun is so bright it seems to blind him. He's only just emerged, of course, from the nocturnal shadows, and he's still wrapped in his trench coat. He suffers a further indignity when he's forced to wait for the parade to pass before limping across the street. Enley is the focal point of the town's celebration of recently completed housing development for veterans. Of course, in the post-war period, there was a huge housing shortage. The former captain, Enley, is publicly celebrated as a war hero and a pillar of the community whose determination and leadership kept everyone's morale up and helped them stick together through difficult moments during the construction process. Parkinson's vendetta begins the unraveling of this perfect life. Enley's hysterical response to his old friend's arrival prompts his wife, Edith, who has made it a policy never to ask her husband about his war experiences and occasionally strange behavior, to confront him. He guesses that it was because of Parkson that Frank suddenly decided to move from New York to California without even collecting his pay in the Army. The sunny California of the film's beginning disappears into a bleak nighttime world. Much of the film is, filled, is uh, set in the old Bunker Hill neighborhood of Los Angeles. In a chilling scene, that sits in the back stairwell of a hotel, Frank confesses to his wife. As all the drunken conventioneers celebrate outside to the strains of the song Happy Days Are Here Again, Frank tells Edith everything. How, as the senior officer, he was responsible for the men, but nearly insane with hunger. How his men go among them, dug an escape tunnel. How, knowing they had no chance, Frank informed the SS colonel in charge where the tunnel was in order to get some leniency for his men, and how the colonel broke his promise. They set a trap for them, he tells her. They bayoneted them. They set dogs on them. And when it was over, they didn't even shoot them. They just left them there. Edith tries to reassure him that he simply did what he deemed best and that he should not be punished for the rest of his life for one dreadful mistake. But Frank refused 
is this consolation. And this is what he said, and I think it's a strikingly forthright speech. I was an informer. It doesn't make any difference why I did it. I betrayed my men. They were dead. The Nazis even paid me a price. They gave me food, and I ate it. I ate it. I hadn't done it just to save their lives. I talked myself into believing it, that he'd keep his word. In my guts from the start, I think I knew he wouldn't. And maybe I didn't even care. They were dead, and I was eating. And maybe that's all I did it for, to save one man. There were six widows. There were ten men dead, and I couldn't even stop eating. Active violence traumatizes the contest between remembering and forgetting the war and one's deeds in it. Along the way, both men are drawn to criminal acts. Emily becomes almost accidentally involved in a plot to kill Parkson. And in the climactic scene that follows, Emily runs desperately through an empty tunnel in Los Angeles trying to outpace all the voices in his head that reproduce that fateful night at the prisoner of war camp. Parkson, meanwhile, by preserving the past, keeps sane during a long hospital stay while his leg healed. I kept remembering, he says. I kept thinking back to that prison. Determined to murder his former commander, Parkson is prevented from committing the crime only by chance. Both men are transformed, deformed by their pasts. Remembering proves as treacherous as forgetting for them. Ultimately, Frank atones for his crime by dying to save Joe's life. But visually, the movie ends where it began, with poor Joe limping off to the damp night, this time on his way to tell Edith that she is a widow. Framed, trapped, driven to crime by desperation, uncontrollable rage, many of the veterans of post-war film noir become fugitives. The feeling that the veterans' youth, innocence, and prospects have been stolen from them by the war animates these films with currents of resentment and anxiety. The noir veteran is always on the move, sometimes simply restless, just as often committed to a desperate hunt for truth. The amnesiac's search for his lost identity, the wrongly accused's quest to clear his name, the friend's attempt to track down a lost war buddy, his status as a wanderer, Odysseus, a stranger turning up in different towns, often asking uncomfortable questions about the past that everyone else would soon forget, makes him inherently suspicious. War records, even good ones, provokes his further suspicion in noir because the violence they document has become theoretically unacceptable in peacetime. Routinely investigated by law enforcement officials and others, these records are invoked as evidence of good character, competence, trustworthiness, even as they raise concerns that the erstwhile service member has developed dependence on violence to solve problems. By proving a veteran's ability to kill, a service record makes him a likely suspect in violent crimes at home. As the Cold War continued to develop, certain reconfigurations had to happen. And this next section turns to those guidebooks I mentioned earlier and reads them, and they're all government documents, and so they're really available and can be, I think, read profitably with your students. These books change a bit in character, and one of the most interesting of them is something called a pocket guide to anywhere. Most guides were devoted to certain locations, to certain countries or regions, but this one was supposed to work for any place that a soldier or sailor might find himself or herself. And what they needed to do was to make the Cold War mission explicable to soldiers. One of these, A Pocket Guide to Alaska, which was published in 1951, reflects the new way of understanding the world. The defense of Alaska is a vital job. We don't want Alaska's Dutch Harbor to become another Pearl Harbor, it said. Soldiers in Europe were apparently no clearer on the significance of their assignments 
and the guides to countries reaching from Greece to Korea emphasize the struggle raging between democracy and the forces of communism. These guides all express anxiety lest their readers spoil America's good reputation among their various allies. Like the wartime guides before them, repeated injunctions against arrogance. Remember, reads a typical warning, crossing the water doesn't make you a hero. Or, as the guide to Japan puts it, a conquering hero complex isn't going to help anybody. The 1950 guide to Korea gives the mission new messianic overtones. The free nations of the world, it says, look to us to lead and guide them through these tense and trying days. Everyone, it continued, is waiting to see what will happen in the world. But fortunately, the United States has a major role in shaping the future. The ambitious cultural instruction that distinguished the wartime guides disappears from these later editions, even if a general spirit of discovery survives until the end of the guide's life cycle in the late 80s. When words about terrorism become far more prominent than encouragements to tourism. The political education provided in these guides is hopelessly simplistic, the history dangerously selective. Soldiers stationed in Germany are told in the 1951 guide that playing baseball with German kids might well be the best way to illustrate the value of, quote, the American way of life. There is also a lack of information regarding Germany's recent history. The millions who died at Nazi hands go largely unremarkable even if a paragraph on the many displaced persons the GI is likely to encounter in Germany and the guide acknowledges to find rather dirty and distasteful, ignores what displaced these persons in the first place. The Harrison Report, compiled in August 1945 by the delegate sent by President Truman to inspect these displaced person camps, asserted, quote, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. End quote. The service member who found himself in Japan, the rapid democratization of which was being superintended by General Douglas MacArthur, was informed that he was not simply an ambassador, but also a salesman of democracy. The guy assures its readers that Emperor Hirohito has been rehabilitated and has learned how to behave democratically. Despite the general air of condescension, there is a recognition that the issue of the atom bomb requires special handling. The rather coy allusion to Hiroshima in the 1950 version is less flippant in editions produced in the wake of the 1951 peace treaty. A smaller city on the southern coast of Honshu, teases the earlier guide, is famous for another reason, as the target of the first atomic bomb ever used in war. Its name, Hiroshima. Also softened or qualified over the years, the injunction carried over from the World War II guides to, quote, be an American. By 1952, this has been revised to be a good American. One of the more bizarre informational pamphlets the government published during this period is, as I suggested, a pocket guide to anywhere. It was published in 1953 and reprinted in 1956. It's at once a celebration of the post-war U.S. economic and security partnerships with countries throughout the world, and a cautionary tale about American hubris. It features two fictional American soldiers, Bill and Joe, and an elaborate thought experiment crafted by Joe for the benefit of Bill, the most clueless of GIs. The notion that one hand can suit every destination suggests that the rest of the world, Europe, South America, Africa, Asia, is pretty much the same. But that's precisely the point. Peoples everywhere are alike in their commitment to fighting communism. That's the message of the guide. It is a fight the author says, that transcends diversity of language, custom, religion. Any way you look at it, at, at it the problem of holding back red aggression is just too big for one nation, it declares. Communism is now described as, quote, a threat of aggression even worse than the one we got rid of when we and our allies licked the Nazis and the Japanese war. Yet there are also contradictions. As the guide makes clear, the persistent presence of American defenders of freedom is no longer perceived as a boon throughout the rest of the world. Bill and Joe, once, quote, welcomed warmly as allies by the native populace, have instead become uninvited guests. 
As time went on, the guide reads, the attitude of many of the people changed from friendliness to aloofness, sudden, sullen resentment, or downright dislike. It is Bill's typically American complaint about ingratitude. You'd think they'd show some appreciation of what we're doing for them, he says, that prompts Joe to dispense some official wisdom on behalf of his government. It takes the form of a parable about the mythical nation of Atlantis. First, he asks Bill, how would you like it if a lot of foreign soldiers were camped all over the United States? But this is too great a leap for Bill who's simply incapable of imagining the United States as anything but, quote, the richest and most powerful country in the world. To stand in for the Marshall Plan, Joe invents something called Atlantic Aid. In his hypothetical scenario, the United States is forced to accept, along with various other humiliations and indignities, having troops stationed near Bill's hometown, enduring their unintentionally obnoxious behavior, putting up with their inability to speak English, envying them for being, quote, the sharpest, best paid, and having a huge stockpile of supplies available to them at the post exchange. Worst of all, Joe tells Bill, first thing they do would be to make play for our girls. When Bill finally catches on, Joe cautions him against all those offenses to which an occupying force is susceptible, exhibiting bad manners, criticizing the politics of their allies, and asking they put more money to social welfare than into defense, telling their hosts who won the war and reminding them who continues to pay the bills, failing to understand other cultures, especially those of poor nations that, quote, have a high degree of civilization, end quote, and value other things over material prosperity. Remember, the guy, the reader is admonished, that the shabby little man who shines shoes for a living, you know, scores of half a dozen operas from Overture to the Final Curtain. Americans' bad behavior, Joe explains, plays right into the hands of the communists. Rich with comic illustrations, some of which I've shown here, the guide to anywhere, for the most part, tries to apply a light touch. But it also impresses upon its readers that they are on the front lines of an existential crisis. The devious enemy is at work, the booklet warns, trying to destroy all those who believe in, quote, the inborn dignity of every individual, end quote. It also displays a modest recognition of various ways in which even well-intentioned protectors might blunder in foreign lands. And now, finally, I'd like to turn a backward glance to the Civil War. And I'd like to start this final segment with the story of Fifi. For almost 50 years, the words only airworthy B-29 Superfortress. It was a sleek World War II relic, still flying today in air shows across the U.S. and Canada. Fifi was saved by the commemorative Air Force called the CAF, the Texas 501C3, devoted to preserving and restoring American combat work or to combat aircraft. The CAF originated in 1961, incident with the Civil War Centennial, under a different name, the Confederate Air Force. By 1968, its founders had taken up headquarters in Texas on a part of the old Harlingen Air Force Base that they renamed Rebel Field. Ken Jenkins' article in 1963 in Sports Illustrated called The Confederate Air Force Flies at Last presents a really cheerful profile of this group of World War II pi- former World War II pilots, all of them who had been commissioned colonels in the Confederate Air Force. Dressed in gray, suffused with nostalgia, and relying, as Jenkins writes, heavily on the Confederate whimsy as an excuse for social rallies. The rebel air militia has become one of the most elite clubs in the valley, he reports. Apparently, there were no difficulties about all of what Jenkins called Confederate whimsy until 2001, when members voted to rename the organization. The group's website does not discuss the change beyond note of the date it went into effect. The Confederate Air Force is symptomatic 
of national tendency to turn the Civil War into a kind of theme park in which nostalgia and mendacity have eclipsed largely the raw and unpleasant truth that one army fought and lost a battle for the liberty to enslave other human beings, while the other, full of imperfect men fighting for a variety of motives, nevertheless secured the emancipation of those human beings, and thereby preserved a political experiment underwritten by the ideas of equality. Carol and Janney, the historian, eloquently explored the vicissitudes of Civil War memory in a recent webinar in this series, and I hope you had a chance to see it, or will, in the future. Our political experiment entered a new phase with the Second World War, a conflict in which the United States, despite domestic divisions and an initial reluctance to enter the war, sided with the forces of liberation and became a symbol of enduring freedom for the rest of the world. It would become a triumphalist narrative, perhaps ultimately most persuasive to Americans themselves. The countries the United States helped to liberate and subsequently occupied often tired of it before we did. Although remembrance of the Civil War, which tends to submerge causes in a celebration of honor on the battlefield and fraternal reconciliation, there is a special relationship between the nation's two watershed conflicts. The Civil War textures various World War II narratives, official and unofficial. On May 29, 1945, for example, after nearly two months of fighting on Okinawa, Marines broke through the main line of Japanese defenses in what marked a turning point in the battle for the island. Atop Shuri Ridge sat the ruins of Shuri Castle, a relic of an ancient kingdom. Conquered by Japanese troops during the late 18th century Meiji Restoration, and destroyed by American artillery in the battle. The capture of this castle had both strategic and symbolic importance. The Marine E.B. Sledge reveals in his book with the Old Breed, where he writes, Early in the morning, Company A, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, had attacked eastward into the ruins of Shuri Castle and had raised the Confederate flag. When we learned that the flag of the Confederacy had been hoisted over the very heart and soul of Japanese resistance, all of us Southerners cheered, cheered loudly. The Yankees among us grumbled, and the Westerners didn't know what to do. This uncharacteristically lighthearted passage follows fledged, graphically detailed depiction of the Marines' battle on a slope of the ridge. Sledge's depiction of A Company's planting of the Confederate flag atop the rubble, quote, over the very heart and soul of Japanese resistance, is in fact the closest this grim book gets to a triumphant moment almost the only whip of romance in an otherwise notably cold-eyed narrative of war. That fled with some amusement at the consternation of the Northerners and the bemusement of the Westerners, yet without irony, should link victory with the first planting, first with the planting of the Confederate flag, and only later with the stars and stripes that was raised afterward, calls attention to a fault line that runs through American history, a line linking the mythology of the World War II the country's defining foreign conflict to that of its cataclysmic civil war. In The Legacy of the Civil War, a book written on the eve of the war's centennial in 1961, the poet and novelist Robert Penn Warren reflected on the ways in which the 19th century insurrection continued to shape its 20th century history. Toward the end of that book, Warren illuminates an intimate connection between the Civil War and World War II. We can remember, he writes, that during World War II, the Civil War, not the Revolution, was characteristically used in our propaganda, and that it was the image of Lincoln, not that of Washington or Jefferson, that flashed ritualistically on the silver screen after the double feature, and in classrooms for young Air Force specialists, and perhaps elsewhere. It was sometimes pointed out that the Founding Fathers were not really democratic, that democracy stemmed from the Civil War. There were certainly connections made to Washington and the Revolution in various propaganda campaigns, but the examples of this appeal to the Civil War are quite prominent, as you can see here and in several of the other posters that I've shown. They include a quotation from the Gettysburg Address, We highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, which appeared on the War Office of War Information's 1942 Remember December 7th poster, and the use of Lincoln's image and words to sell liberty bonds. 
The connection was drawn in unofficial context as well. For example, Robert Sherwood's 1938 Pulitzer Prize winning play Abe Lincoln in Illinois turns the story of Lincoln's own internal struggle over the issue of slavery into an allegory of anti-isolationism. But if the idea of Lincoln proved useful to the war effort in the 1940s, it was the ideal of the South's lost cause that continued to exert enormous popular appeal and to texture the ways in which Americans understood war's past and prospect. This narrative had been nurtured during the First World War, which overlapped with the Civil War's 50th anniversary. It was endorsed by President Woodrow Wilson, whose multi-volume History of the American People offers as unreconstructed a vision of U.S. race relations as one can find. In 1913, Wilson presided over the 50th anniversary reunion of veterans at Gettysburg, when sentimental remembrance of the Civil War reached its zenith in the photographs of white-bearded, roomy-eyed old men, medals dangling from their chests, shaking hands on the very ground over which they had once tried to kill each other. As Carol and Janney noted in her presentation, these photos are frequently misread as sentimental reunions. That's how we wanted to see them. The cult of the lost cause, stoked by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and other powerful interest groups, remained strong throughout the 30s in the pre-war period. Tributes such as that paid by President Roosevelt himself at the dedication of a statue of Robert Lee Dallas in 1936 were unremarkable in the Jim Crow South, also home to the Army's largest posts. One obvious reminder of the ongoing affinity between the U.S. military and the lost cause the number of those posts named for Confederate officers during the great boom in military installations occasioned by both world wars. Fortunately, those forts are now being in the process of being renamed. Robert Penn Warren understood that it was quite normal during what he called a period of crisis for Americans, as for any people, to, quote, look back upon their past and try to find therein some clue to their nature and their destiny. But Warren discerned that the Civil War's haunting of the Second World War was a symptom of a more enduring political and cultural obsession. World War II, he wrote, merely initiated the period of crisis through which we are passing, and it's only natural that the Civil War looms larger now than ever before, not only in the South, but across the country. That preoccupation, chronicled so thoroughly by the historian David Blight and others, has not abated in the years since the war's 150th anniversary. Memories of the Revolutionary War were distant and regional, while memories of World War I, although they may well have been bitter, involved a great geographical remove. Memories of the Civil War, the only other major war to take place on home soil, were still alive. And it was politically expedient, especially in the Jim Crow South, to keep them sharp. The wild success of Margaret Mitchell's 1936 novel, Gone with the Wind, to say nothing of the film adaptation, revealed the degree to which Americans warmed to the Confederacy's lost cause and to the memory of Reconstruction as an oppressive tyranny. In the years before World War II, it was the Civil War, to a greater degree than any other national conflict, that preoccupied Americans and their image of it was shaped by sentimentality, romance, and distortion. What's the point of this in connection with World War II? Well, today, we see frail old men in all caps meeting together at Normandy, as their aged forebearers once did at Gettysburg, to commemorate their role and their real sacrifice in a war that is drifting out of history and into legend. Before World War II is sealed away forever, like the Civil War before it, it's in an epic past that we can no longer retrieve. Before we utterly transform those who fought it into symbols of greatness, perhaps there is no time to reckon with the myths that mask a far more complex truth. Each generation has found a new use for the good war. Nostalgia for the war years remains a bulwark against doubt and disillusion. A great golden age to which we can always go back to remember who we were and be again, seeking safety through violent conflict, 
because once we thought we found it there. Retaining a faith in the American capacity for exceptional violence. Victory in the 20th century second global conflict transformed the world and at the same time condemned the United States to a futile quest for another war just as good, just as definitive, just as transformational. Wars, I would submit to you, never can do the work of redemption, even when their causes meet generally agreed upon criteria for justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samet. We have truly enjoyed it this evening. I'm looking at our time. Um, we have a few moments for a few questions. Actually, there is one um, that Allison put in the chat, um, and I'll go ahead and read that out for you uh, as well. Again, Allison, thank you for your question. Alan, Alice, Allison is out of Santa Rosa Junior College, but her question is, <clears throat> How would you characterize World War II pro propaganda as a good war, as, a compa as compared with World War I propaganda under the Committee on Public Information, as the propaganda for both wars impacted the American public at the time? And I believe you, you addressed that a little bit as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I touched on it mm -hmm. just a little. Um, you know, the... the sort of messianic rhetoric, um, the idea of, of pauses and uh, a kind of war as a, as a, uh, as a, a kind of redemption, a purgation, um, those are all part and parcel of World War I rhetoric. Um, and as Allison clearly knows from this, this question, it was, so, uh, it was so important and then led to such disillusion and bitterness after that war and to Isolation. You know, the war to end all wars, of course, did not do that. Um, and then the propaganda of World War II, and some of it, of course, I've shown here, you know, really runs the gamut. Of course, it wanted to imbue this war with, uh, to those who were fighting it with a clear sense of cause. Um, but it was also clear that, and, and many people who were fighting write about this, that there wasn't the same kind of fervor. Um, that many Americans had felt earlier. Um, and so the propaganda worked to, to manufacture that. I think that we speak much more often about the European theater because the propaganda directed about the Pacific theater was all based on vengeance, vengeance for Pearl Harbor. Um, and the European conflict required a different kind of propaganda. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And thank you again for that question, Allison. Another question um, that came up along the way was the question of, uh, you mentioned brutal, how the sense of brutality was mitigated by the national temperament. Uh, I remember that language specifically, but how did that permeate other areas of the American experience beyond uh, popular culture? Um, also looking into uh, the area of conspicuous consumption, which followed uh, World War II. Um, is that something you can expand on a little bit? Um, how it permeated other areas as far as the national con conscious? Yeah, well, maybe maybe I'll take the the the, uh, area, the question about conspicuous consumption and materialism first, um, mm -hmm. because it seemed very much that, that that's one of the themes in Studs Terkel's book. It was the idea that, um, that there were so many people who um, made a great profit out of the war. Um, and I think that some of the, of the returning uh, service members came back to a complete, you know, they had left and it was still you know, the end of the Depression. They came back to a completely changed uh, country. And I think the, the material success um, and the promise of material success that seemed open to so many after the war um, was met with, with various reactions by, by the, the um, turn service personnel. And I think many of the films of the period, and not just film noir, but other kinds of films, emphasize that. Um, so veterans who, who can't seem to sort of latch onto a job or make a lot of money, I'm thinking of something like The Best Years of Our Lives, um, which is a film that many people in your audience might know, um, where the uh, the Air Force veteran played by Dana Andrews comes back um, and he 
says that the one thing he doesn't want is his old job, which he had, you know, as a teenager, uh, the working at a soda fountain is the one thing he won't do. And that turns out, at least initially, to be the only job he can find. And so when he measures himself, he sees everybody else. He knows the status that he had in the war, and he knows the, the pay that he received. And then when he takes off his uniform, he feels like he's a different person, uh, and he doesn't, doesn't want to compete and can't quite compete um, in this new post-war world uh, where he feels that people have moved on and society has moved on without him. Um, and I think that the first part of the, the first question you asked, in terms of this notion of, um, if I understood it correctly, of, of uh, brutality and violence. Um, I think that the, the my, my point about a sort of, um, Amer we believe that America has a sort of exceptional violence. Um, I, I think that that is a direct consequence of World War II in the sense that um, this was a war that did, in fact, liberate millions of people. And that was the consequence. Um, but as I suggested at the beginning of the talk, it wasn't necessarily the animating cause um, of our participation. The direct cause, of course, being the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, and even if some Americans, the premier anti-fascists among them, uh, members of the Roosevelt administration, understood this as an existential fight, it took a long time for many Americans to the same way. And I think the fact that violence did achieve this consequence in World War II has made us feel, despite the failures of many military uh, enterprises in the wake of World War II, has somehow made us feel that um, we use violence in order to secure the ends of liberation and democracy. And that may often be the intent, but it is all too rare uh, that wars you know, result in clear uh, victories um, and clear uh, massive liberations the way that World War II did. Uh, and yet I think we always feel that when we do deploy our forces, that's of course what we hope and feel the outcome uh, ought to be. Right. Thank you so much. And we truly appreciate your, your time this evening. Um, we are almost uh, at our uh, cutoff point here. And I want to thank uh, you just for sharing your, your expertise and uh, it was so uh, thought provoking and illuminating. And uh, all of the teachers, as I'm reviewing the chat, the comments uh, throughout this evening um, have all been overwhelmingly uh, well, positive and appreciative and in many ways they are reconsidering approaches to how they teach and um, engage in overall conversation about the greatest generation and uh, the good war and uh, we appreciate you just encouraging us all to to examine that myth and um, also consider ways that our students and communities, uh, how we can better understand our country's history, um, where we stand and our future pot uh, potential. So um, uh, we definitely appreciate you. And again, thank you all for spending your evening with us. Uh, special thanks to Gina for her service on the THC, as well as uh, her presence and contributions to the chat uh, as well. I'd encourage you all to tune in again uh, for our January 24th 2023 webinar, Does Contempt Belong in Public Life? And we'll have Krista Thomason, who was an NHC fellow in 2021-22, uh, but also an associate professor, Department of Philosophy at Swarthmore College. So if you have not already registered, please check that out. Um, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm absolutely sure you will enjoy it. And again, as I said before, I encourage you all to keep up with what's happening at the National Humanities Center through our various social media feeds to get updates on our activities and all of the goings on at this center. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again during our Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Uh, take care and be well. Mm -hmm.